This week on the podcast, we welcome comedian Brad Williams. Funny in this business is the ultimate currency. It, it, it's the only thing people care about. Any comedy club and you're sitting in green room like, oh, like, and you, you see so many different types of people that are in so many different, like identify in so many different types of ways. And we're all just hanging out because we're all funny. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. That's all anyone cares about is just being funny. No one's... No one's taking stock of like, well, how many women are in this room? How many people of color are in this room? How many trans? Yeah. Are in this room? It's just funny. Yeah. It's just funny, and that and that's it. And and like, I never looked around and thought to myself like, oh, there's no other dwarves. I don't see any other little people around, so I'm fucked. Like, I'm not gonna. I don't have a representation. I just looked at it like, oh, I just have to be funny, and that's it. This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Pettisy. I'm Bridget Pettisy, and you are welcome. <laughs> you know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind the scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at fetacy.com. All right, our first podcast back in the new year. I am with my old friend, Brad Williams. Welcome. I am ki I'm kicking off the new year. How's it going? The Going fantastic. I am so happy to be your first guest of the new year. A uh, lot of pressure. I feel like I'm <laughs> setting the standard for however the rest of the year is going to go. But you also um, start off the year with a dwarf. And uh, that's something that I doubt you did last year. So new new year, new you. Is, it, is that like good luck? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb and say yes. Uh, uh, they, Almost anything involving little people tends to be good luck. So I'm just going to say, yeah, sure. Like, so there was one time I did a gig at a casino and there was a large group. I don't want to get it wrong. So we'll say Asian. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know from what region uh, uh, Asian. And uh, I was, they, the casino had me say like, hey, they're having a big tournament. Best of luck, everybody. And so I got in a microphone and I said, best of luck, whatever. And then they started walking up and rubbing my head, uh, <laughs> which I don't like. I'm not a fan of. Uh, uh, never never was I like, thank God that person patted me on the head. That felt amazing. Um, and then they all started doing it. And I kind of, uh, the whoever was with me could tell that I was very uncomfortable. But he, but he's like, they're all high rollers. Just keep it going. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. So, uh, yeah, that happened one time. And apparently that was good luck. So I, I have no idea. You're like Just me of, being around. You're like one luck. of those little kitties that they have. The little like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like the death, like the death squad. Kitties. Yeah. 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 Something. I don't know. And, and, and I wish I knew more. If any of your listeners could be like, ah. That's because of the 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 fable of the little farmer or something like that. Like if, if 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 someone has an answer why a particular Asian group thought that rubbing my head was good luck, please let me know. I would love to hear. This it. is gonna be. It's you can just be like one of those holidays you make up for your wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like why it's not? the new year. It's the good luck yeah. day. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good luck, dwarf day. Congratulations, <laughs> you married one. You, 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 you won. You did it. Yeah. Cause, uh, cause my wife is Chinese. And when, and when I told her that story, she had no idea. Oh, interesting. Okay. No clue. Okay. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's Chinese. No, <laughs> no. They just like killing rhinos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll take note of that. So any <laughs> animal conservationists. Uh, ne never bring a rhino into my home. I think I can avoid that. I think I, I, I think I'll be okay. How is the special going? Special's going great. The new special is called Starfish. It is on a sort of a a, a newish 
platform uh, called Veeps, uh, V-E-E-P-S. And uh, Veep started off as like this uh, concert thing to where you could go and watch uh, either live concerts or recorded concerts from a bunch of different artists. Like right now you can go on, there's like Alicia Keys concert, there's an Imagine Dragons concert you can watch. But now they're getting comedy specials. Oh, that's great. And they're, they're doing stuff like, they're doing stuff with me and David Cross and Catherine Ryan and uh, 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 a, a few others. So yeah, by all, it, it, they're, they're, they're getting to that game. So you can go to veeps.com, search for my comedy special and enjoy it. And the, the cool part is, is there's like a chat uh... that goes on. So you can watch, you, you can look at other people uh, that have watched my special, and uh, and if any, any, anyone's watching it at that exact moment live, you could chat with them. It's like this cool interactive experience. Uh, my mom was on the chat, and <laughs> she's like, "People have very interesting things to say about you." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." Uh, I didn't know about the whole chat function until my mom got to it and was like, and started commenting on all the things that people were saying. So just know that my mother is reading the chat. <laughs> she's the moderator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, did young you man. Know that so, yeah, did you know that so many women are fetishizing you? <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mom. I mean, that's better than what my chats devolve into a lot of the time when I'm on YouTube and stuff. So I'd probably prefer the fetishizing than... Yeah, why not? I I I feel like uh, I I feel like since I've known you, you've run the full gamut. Like you've like you've done the that part, and now and now you're doing this the, this new part of your career, which I which I'm re, which I'm really enjoying. By the well, way, it's, I'm really it's, happy for your success. Thank you. It's weird though. I've come. I'm coming full circle. So I started getting back on stage recently again because I took three years off and had got married had a baby and i've been joking like my husband and i hit three years and that's why i'm back on stage <laughs> like yeah. the shine's worn off he's like okay go get your chuckles from some strangers um <laughs> and so yeah it's been and i wasn't sure if it was just like a phase like a that lesbian summer i had or you know like maybe it was something <laughs> i did for 10 seven years or whatever and then <laughs> i decided it wasn't for me and i got back on and that first set i was like damn it and now it's all oh. i want to do oh so, so it's, i'm back it's that yeah. it's that yeah. you're in i'm in uh first of all um uh, lesbian summer. I hope they play Coachella <laughs> next year because that sounds like a great band. Maybe maybe we could get them out to uh, uh, Austin, yeah, Texas. ACL. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad that you're that you're back doing it. And it's one of those things. I I I I, I imagine that you know you've gotten uh, more popular and and you definitely get a response from your tweets and from your shows and everything like that. But there's nothing like the live response there's nothing. nothing like the hey let me say something that i just thought of or wrote down or a, a, a thought that i had and uh then just getting that live laugh because as i've told people like one of the most amazing parts about watching stand-up comedy like on youtube or something for me is that you read comments underneath that say not funny yeah but then in the video there's hundreds sometimes thousands of people laughing they're like not funny it's like well you can't say that. The, a thousand people laugh, yeah. so you're good. You're, that's funny. It, it's not funny to you. You might not find it funny, but you can't say it's not funny. And so you 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 can't get that immediate response doing a podcast or or um, giving a tweet and get a bunch of likes, but it's not that it's not that response. No, it's not that laughter. It's so kinetic. You know, it's so tangible yeah. and and. I love the awkwardness and, and you know, it's weird. I thought I would be, because I always, and still do wrestle with like massive stage fright. And I thought that sure. the time off would make that worse and doing all the podcasts and do, and I would never really want to interact with the crowd. I was terrified of crowd work. I was kind of terrified yeah. of the crowd, but something <laughs> changed in the three to four, I guess it's like four years. Um, mm -hmm. it, almost exactly. And and I maybe it's all the interviewing because I was doing all these other reps like my show Dumpster Fire and it does translate like those skills just now I'm like, I want to know what everyone is thinking. I want to talk to every single yeah. person in the audience because yeah. I've been interviewing people for four years straight. Yeah. And, and now you have and it definitely is a skill set that 
does translate. I, I, as soon as you started talking about the, the the stage fright is gone, part of me thought to myself, I wonder if it's because now she's cleaned human shit <laughs> that now she th- she she feels like nothing you can do, nothing an audience can do will ever make you feel the way you feel. And like, you know, what like clean, cleaning up after your child, which now both you and I have done. Uh, uh, that that to me, I stopped caring about anything else as soon as my kid came in. Yeah, world, exactly. Uh, where I'm just like, you can't affect me. Like you can. I got, I have a little human to keep alive. That's, that's, that's my focus. And it's like a very grounding, um, I feel like before I got married and then had a kid, but even before I met my partner, there is something mm-hmm. about, you know, there's that saying like, choose your mate wisely, because it is like a superpower when you have that love. It's not like when I started in, and I started late. So I started at 30 around, but it, there was still yeah. like an, and it was before I even got sober. So that helped things too. But there, there was just <laughs> this like kind of desperate hole I was trying to fill or there's something it wasn't I feel yeah. very like I leave my my house with my family and that's all everything else is gravy if they're okay this is all gravy and it gives Done. me this like solid core to go from that it doesn't like I don't care you can boo yeah. me. and then if for it, like when you stunk and you bombed before then you come home and you just have to wallow in that misery of the bomb. And now, like, if I come home after a bomb, my kid doesn't care. No. My kid doesn't care that I just bombed. She just runs up and she gives me a big hug and she says, Daddy's home. And, oh, all right. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Yeah, done. That's it. That's all I, that I'm good. How uh, old is your uh, kid now? She will be turning four oh, wow. uh, very in a couple of weeks. Oh wow! So. Our kids are kind of close yeah. in age. Uh, mine will be two in uh, uh, like a couple months. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. So so my daughter was born, and then the world shut down. Right. And then the world just started opening up, and that's when your kid was. Yes, born. they're pandemic babies okay. though. Pandemic babies. Yeah, they'd be in the same high school. <laughs> you know, they're the same. Yeah. The same. Oh my. Oh my God. Uh, I, I think about that. I moved out of Hollywood. I'm still. I'm still in California. I'm still in Southern California. Okay. But uh, uh, I I moved out of the Hollywood area because I can't have my kid go to school with an actor's. No, kid. that's why we left. <laughs> that's why we left L.A. It, it it sounds crazy and it sounds like so like, well, th- yeah, they're, what do you think everyone's going to be perfect in whatever town you're in? No, I know they're not. I just don't want to be going to parent teacher conference and 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 see someone that I'm just like, oh, God, now I got to do this. Like, <laughs> I I don't. I just don't. I, I want my kid to grow up around what whatever normal is like my daughter all already will not have a normal childhood a she's a little person her father's a little person um i'm an entertainer i'm a i'm a comedian i don't know if that's gonna make her life strange but i'm gone you know three four days a week i want to keep it as mayberry as possible Mm -hmm. i want to keep like white picket fence just like normal calm not 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 a lot of stuff going on. I don't want everyone in her class to be holding their phones up and streaming every time they 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 take a shit. Uh, I I don't want that to happen. So hopefully it doesn't. But you know we we do our best to keep our kids safe and keep our kids what we feel to be in a healthy environment. So we'll see if we'll we'll see if that goes there. So do you think that the culture being kind of I mean, for lack of a better word, I always say that there, I think the seeds of like wokeness are ultimately very good. I think that they take into their extremes, it's very bad. But do you think that since you came up in high school versus your daughter, that the culture has shifted or do you, do you think she's going to deal with some of the same crap? Yeah, uh, I've all, I'm already seeing it that it's a little better. And by the way, I like that you said the seeds of wokeness are good because the seeds of wokeness are empathy. It's just like, empty. Yep. oh, what what I was doing was hurting you. Sorry, I will do my best to not do yeah. that. I mean, 
like you said, taking to an extreme level. Okay, now we can. Yeah, it's like body positivity, it, it, I think, is great in theory because when I grew up, yeah. we were, we were, I was dying laughing. There was this thing on Instagram and it was going around and it was um, Tyra Banks. I think it was that show that she was on. And yes. did you see this? I and I was this. like, this considered a plus size model. And I'm like, no wonder I've said bad body dysmorphia. This is like a normal it, size woman. It, she was like a size three or something like that. Like it was n it, like nothing. And then they're, they're like, well, you could be in the plus size. Ca I'm like plus size. You could fit through a door when it's closed and you're dying. plus size. My husband and I Good. were laughing so oh. hard. I was like, no wonder we have such bad body dysmorphia. Yeah. <laughs> yes, totally. So yes, bot body positivity but um, I in 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 small in 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 that in that way is yes very good but it's now but like yes, taken to the extreme you're like no you morbid obesity is not healthy we shouldn't be advocating this yes either when, <laughs> when you look at a morbidly obese person and and the company is like this is this is what beauty looks <laughs> like it's like nope um Je uh, jeff die uh the the comedian jeff die has a great joke about this where he says uh if everyone says Lizzo is beautiful, why do women get insulted when you say, "Hey, you look like Lizzo"? <laughs> like, I I love yeah. that joke. I mean, but but anyway, um, to go back to your original yes. question, uh, yes, uh, I think it is getting better because like uh, my daughter goes to school now, and now all the kids like are trying to like, not I mean they're they're all friendly with her and they're and they're like some are like trying to protect her and some are like like and, and I'm just like this is I did not <laughs> go to school during this time. <laughs> I was at school and kids just saw me and saw me as a little person and was like ah fresh meat that I I'm going it, to it, it's the whole theory of like when you're running away from a, a bear or a shark or something like you don't have to be the fastest person you just can't be the slowest person <laughs> like the the most messed up kids in my class saw me walk in was like oh good i'm not the most fucked up let's attack let's attack the little person yeah. which th then they found out very quickly that was a bad idea uh <laughs> but yeah but that but that was due to my uh that was due to my dad uh my dad not a dwarf uh he knew i would be bullied in school so what he did is he and i would write jokes together before i even went to school that's amazing so, like yeah, we'd write comebacks, and then when kids came and made fun of me, I would just zing them back, and then they'd be like, "Oh shit!" Like, like I like I messed with the wrong guy, and uh, now I can't wait to do that with my daughter. Like, I'm almost in a weird way looking forward to when she comes home and she says, "Ah, oh, so and so said this about me," because I'm just gonna take out a pen and paper and be like, "Tell me everything. <laughs> Tell me everything about this kid." Every, what, You're what like they writing wear. roast jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yes what their hair looks like and you know if some kids come c c comes up and be like you're a midget i'll have her yell back like yeah but i'm here because my parents love each other you're here because your mom doesn't swallow <laughs> like i'll do something like that and and then yeah just make the other kid cry it's gonna be i i can't wait for that <laughs> that's gonna be so fun what a bonding experience for you and your father too and is that where you yeah. really got your love of comedy from yeah, yeah. Absolutely, thousand percent. He and I would watch old. Uh, I remember growing up watching old Robin Williams videos with him. Watching the Smothers Brothers, uh, R. Uh, I. P. One of them just passed away. Um, watching Jonathan Winters and just like watching that with him and just like seeing that the power that humor could have and being like, oh, I could do that. And then, but I never thought comedy could be a profession though right I, I i i never thought like i i thought oh i'll be the funny guy at the office whatever the office <laughs> right is. i'll be the funny dude or i'll be the funny guy in class whatever like i didn't think that i could actually make a living doing this uh so that's kind of crazy that i'm coming to you now from an office that was paid for by jokes yeah that's, that's amazing strange. i'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor Sometime in the early 80s, REO Speedwagon's airplane made an unannounced middle-of-the-night landing. This is my friend Kyle McLaughlin, the star of Twin Peaks. 
and he's telling me about how he discovered a real-life Twin Peaks in rural North Carolina, not far from where he filmed Blue Velvet. What was on the plane was copious amounts of drugs coming in from South America. Supposedly, Pablo Escobar went looking for other spots, quiet, out-of-the-way places to bring in his cocaine. My name is Joshua Davis, and I'm an investigative reporter. Kyle and I talk all the time about the strange things we come across, but nothing was quite as strange as what we found in Varnumtown, North Carolina. There's crooked cops, brother against brother. Everyone's got a story to tell, but does the truth even exist? Welcome to Varnumtown. Varnum Town is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Well, how how many specials have you done now? Is this your fourth? Fifth? Yeah, this fourth. Is four. Okay. So, yeah, and um, if you go out and see me on tour now, and uh, I'll be coming to Austin. I'm doing a Moon Tower Comedy Festival, doing the doing the Paramount Theater. Um, it, 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 if you come see me there or where, or wherever, it's going to be a different hour than you watched on the special. So if you watch my special on Veeps, I got a different hour. So we're good. That's amazing. <laughs> so what, yeah. um, I, I just had a question. I totally blanked. Um, it's okay. I can keep talking. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I have so many questions. I think that's the problem. When, when did you start doing comedy? Uh, I just hit 20 years, wow. so I'm 39. So I was when I was 19 in October. Uh, uh, so yeah, 20 years, and I got started because I was in the audience of a comedy club uh, j- with my dad, and uh, and the comedian on stage was making midget jokes, and half the audience was laughing, and the audience that was sitting around me was like, <laughs> like not like not laughing. And the comedian noticed they weren't laughing. He's like, what? These jokes are funny. Why aren't you laughing? He goes, what? Is one of them here? And I just went, yep. <laughs> and I raised my creepy little hand in the air. And uh, the comedian called me up on stage and he st- and uh, started asking me questions. I didn't try and be funny. I just answered the questions. But my answers got laughs from the audience. And that was it. And I- Yeah, that was it. I remember he asked me, he goes, well... What do you do for a living? And at the time, I was, you know, I grew up in Orange County, California, and uh, I, I feel like every kid at some point, if you grow up in Orange County, you have to work at Disneyland. So I said, Yeah, I work at Disneyland. <laughs> and and see, and everyone laughed. And then I turned to the audience and I was like, Shut up! I'm not one of the seven. <laughs> and that got a laugh, and I was just like, Oh, that felt really good. That felt fun. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that was it. And then, a- then after that, I started doing open mics. I remember my first time ever on stage, like officially I'm going to do stand up comedy. Um, did, did you ever do the laugh factory open mic night? Did no, I didn't one? do that one. My first night was like one of Matt's shows at comedy store. The, it was a oh. absolute shit show. It was oh. a shit show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, open mic at the laugh factory, which means you sign up at about two o'clock and then you have to wait first of all you wait in line to sign yep. up so you're one so you're, so you're one of the first 20 and then you wait around because you can't leave because the show's at like five o'clock or something so uh and i and i i remember there was a guy there named burger not hamburger who was actually a, a successful comedian just burger and he looks at me and he goes oh i haven't seen you around have you been here before and i go no this is gonna be my very first time on stage and he goes, ah, well, don't worry. I've been doing this 17 years. Just follow my lead, do everything I do, you'll be fine. And I go, no, I'm not going to do everything you do. You've been an open mic comic for 17 years. Like, I don't, I don't want to. That's not my trajectory. No, sorry. After 17 years, the last thing I want to be is here uh, uh, doing in, in this line every Tuesday at 2 o'clock or whatever it is. Uh, so yeah, that, that was my first time, but then the first time went well. And, uh, uh, after that it was off to the races. Yeah. I think I started too late to do a lot of that kind of waiting in line for the open mic stuff. I was just too old. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I, I had to work and I was waiting table. So it was, it somewhat lended itself to it, but then the minute my writing started taking off um, and I started gigging at Playboy. I was doing a weekly column, which is a grind. Like in in and of itself is just a grind. And 
I couldn't really justify, you know, getting spending, especially in LA with the traffic. Like I just couldn't justify that time because it was, I would be at like the comedy store waiting, hoping I could get into the potluck with my computer finishing a column, you know, I'm like, this oh is not God. sustainable. No, <laughs> that, that, and, and, and you get older and I look back and I go, Oh, now I see how the potluck is kind of done at the comedy store. Like, yes, there are some random names that get picked out of a hat, but a lot of them are just like, Hey, this person's cool. I like them or, th or, you know, th th this person has another show that I want to get on. Let's put them on. Or well, you know, like there's like everything. Yep. Everything is politics. Yep. Uh, so there's even politics in the open mic community. Yeah. So yeah, uh, there there might actually be more politics in the open mic community now. I was so it, but... intimidated by the comedy store, and I was there a lot. Yes. But it's like jail up there. <laughs> Just like yes. it felt like. I'll never forget after coming out of doing. I, I think it was very early and Ari Shafir and Crystalia RIP <laughs> just kidding <laughs> 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 and um, uh, Bobby Lee were all standing like right along yeah. you know going into the like the back entrance going up to the belly room and they were like you're gonna need to get up five no six times a week or something like that <laughs> they were i love that they go five no yeah you won't be successful with five times a week six six and then that's they were it. all six roasting times a week. me and i was so intimidated <laughs> i was like oh god Dude, the store is the co the comedy store is intimidating uh i could see and i could see now uh uh i've been to the comedy cellar now and that's intimidating oh, yeah. at the comics table yeah where, where it's just like it's you and then colin yeah. Quinn sits next to yeah. you and then here, and then colin. here comes jim norton yeah and you're just like holy yeah, crap yeah. like this feels crazy uh and but like when you're starting out like yeah i mean i've been to rogan's club a few times in austin and that's a yeah because you're looking around and there's killers hanging around yeah there. yeah so it, it's i remember one time this is and this is one of those only in LA moments. I was gonna do a set at the belly room, and I walked down that long hallway, and in the hallway is Jim Gaffigan, Bill Burr, Burt Kreischer, Bobby yep. Lee, just hanging out. Oh, it just hanging out, and they're all talking yep. shit, and uh, uh. Uh, it, it was Gaffigan and Bert talking about bathrooms on tour buses or whatever. And then uh, I'm intimidating as hell. I'm, I'm not saying anything. And, and then Burr just hears them talking about bathrooms on tour bus. And they're like, shut the fuck up. When you started, you didn't think you'd be making any money. Now we're all driving <laughs> Teslas. Your biggest problem is a bathroom on your tour bus. Shut the fuck up. And, and, and then he goes on stage and kills. I love him. So yeah, that, yeah, of course. He keeps it like, real. You you need that you need that guy. I love the fact that Burr is that guy where where it doesn't matter. It literally now it literally doesn't matter what room he's in. Uh, he doesn't suffer fools. He 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 will not uh, listen to any bullshit. He he just talks about it. So it's great. Uh, but yeah, those like I I I remember that moment going. Oh, this is one of those only in Hollywood moments. And now thankfully. The comedy scene is spread out in places like, like it's always New York and LA, but now it's Austin, yeah. it's Nashville, yeah. Colorado, Denver has an incredible scene, yes. Phoenix has an incredible scene. So now you you have these places all over. So now comics don't necessarily have to live in New York or LA. They can live in one of these other. Yeah, places. it's been interesting. I mean, this has been always like one of my big insecurities has been when you're around these legends who've been doing it forever. I'll get in my head and be like, I'm just a newbie. And even getting back again, it's so humbling. Um, yeah. Even if I did it for however many years, I still wasn't like a regular at the store when I took a break because it just didn't work out. I I wasn't there yet. And, and I wasn't like trying so hard to be there because like I was saying, I didn't have that time to, to like hang around in politic. And I was also very intimidated and I had a friend recently say, no one gives a shit how long you've been doing it if you're funny. 
And I was like, that is the yes. fucking true. It. Why didn't anyone say this to me like yes. 10 years ago? Like, they don't care if you've been doing it for five years or 10 if you make them laugh. Don't care. And that was because I had so in my head about our peers and, the, and them being like, well, she's only. And then I think of Becky Robinson and that girl was killing six months like she was yeah she just got on yeah. stage like she was a headliner the first year she started out and she was amazing dude funny funny in this business is the ultimate currency it, it it's the only thing people care about whatever comic you in your head you think is like racist or homophobic or transphobic or whatever if they're around funny people, it doesn't like it does not matter. Like, I, like I, I have friends that are all of those things and more, and, 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 and that apply to every one of those categories. Like, I'll be sitting in a room in a, in in a green room, not just in New York, not just in L.A., but any any comedy club, and you're sitting in a green room. I'm like, oh, like, and you you see so many different types of people that are in so many different like identify in so many different types of ways, and we're all just hanging out. Because we're all funny, mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah, that's all anyone cares about is just being funny. No one's, no one's taking stock of like, well, how many women are in this room? How many people of color are in this room? How many trans? Yeah. Are in this room? it's just funny. Yeah. it's just funny, and that, and that's it. And and like, I never looked around and thought to myself like, oh, there's no other dwarves. I don't see any other little people around, so I'm fucked. Like, I'm not gonna. I don't have a representation. I just looked at it like, oh, I just have to be funny. And that's it. And thankfully, uh, that apparently worked out. And uh, I, But now I do see other little people doing it. But it, and, and it's exciting. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. But at the same time, I never thought like, oh, I need more little people to be doing comedy. It was just like, oh, just be funny. Yeah. And whatever you are, if you want to get into comedy, just be funny. And that's it. And that's... And comedians are so in their own heads. Yeah. They don't give a shit about you. <laughs> <laughs> they don't give a fuck about you. They don't care. Yeah. You think you, you 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 think like the biggest comic in the world sees you walk by, you say hi, and then as, then as soon as you leave, they're like, oh, that piece of shit. Like, no, yeah. they're they're worried about their own set. Yeah. They're worried about their own jokes. Yeah. They don't give a shit about you. We're all egomaniacs. Yeah. Calm down. <laughs> yeah, that it's it's definitely like a, a such a messed up industry. <laughs> yes, in so many ways. I was thinking recently about our uh, our like very because when I getting back, I was thinking of just when I really started grinding, and um, one of my biggest teachers was our deceased friend Eric Myers and he was the best teacher I had in so many respects but that guy fucking yeah. kill I've still never seen people literally I didn't think people could fall out of their chair laughing and I'll yeah. never forget watching people literally fall out of their chair laughing watching him when he was on fire and then Eric would come off stage and be like, was that okay? Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, dude. Like a guy had a heart just, attack in the aisle. Yeah, you just <laughs> you just laid waste to the stage. That's the thing. Uh, Eric, and if you don't know Eric Myers, please look up any clip you can find of this. Yeah. Uh, uh, and <laughs> I took him on the road for a while, and he and he was opening for me. And I loved having him open for me because I never – it challenged me because he would crush so hard. I never had to worry about, oh, will the audience be ready when I get on stage? Will they be bored? Will it? No, nothing. Just it was already sheer destruction. It's hard so, to follow a and, killer like that, though. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, but it made me better. Yeah. Uh, sink or swim. Uh, iron sharpens iron. Whatever metaphor. You say. <laughs> yeah. What, what, whatever metaphor you want to do. And. It, it was great watching him work. And now um, my current opening act is a comedian named uh, JB Ball. Uh, and he's so fucking good. He's I, I'd sit backstage and I'm like, damn it, you wrote a new 10 minutes already and it's good. And But it's the same thing. I want something, someone really good to go on right before me. A, I want to challenge myself. But B, I, I want the audience to have uh, a great 
full experience. I don't want the first half hour to just be, when does the headliner get on stage? Like, I want them to just be like, yes, yeah, oh, hit her, hit her. Like, I'll get uh, Quincy Weekly, uh, who, j who got passed recently at the Comedy Store. Um, he'll host for me. JB Ball will feature. I'll close it out. And it's just a good show the whole way through. And I love that. Yeah, I saw your previous special when it was recorded. I think it was the previous one, which was which was yeah. one right before this. Uh, uh, well, there was Daddy Issues, which was recorded at the Alex Theater in Pasadena. And then there was The Degenerates, which is on Netflix. And that was in Vegas. No, maybe it was the one. It was the one that was recorded in like North Hollywood. Or not North Hollywood, uh, Glendale. Oh yeah, that was a uh, fun size. Right. That was that was daddy issues. I was mistaken. Not in Pasadena, Glendale. Yep. Oh okay. At the Alex Theater. Yeah, that was Alex so Theater fun. That was yeah. That was it was and it was a great experience from beginning to end, and it was so fun to yeah. see you recording. And, and, and that night, that night I had Adam Ray open up. Yes. The, the, the show. Yeah. And he's a national touring headliner, killing it. You yeah. Know? So it's like. I love funny people to open to make it a full experience. And I'm noticing now that uh, the energy of my crowds is really great. Um, I, like it's so one, one of the nicest things I hear now is waitresses will come up to me from the club when the show is done and be like, I love your audience. Yeah. Be like, yes, good. I love hearing yeah. that. It's, it, it's like, I'm okay. So w whatever I'm doing, it it's bringing really great people out to the show. They're behaving. They're, 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 they're tipping the waitress as well. Um, they're buying merchandise from the opening acts, which is great. You know, everyone, everyone's eating and it's, and it's, and it's wonderful. I, I love having that great show from start, from start to finish. Your new special, what, what do you feel like was the, the hardest part of your new special <laughs> getting the bud light bit right okay <laughs> uh did, did a did, did a bud light joke about the whole controversy with bud light and uh and uh getting that joke right was the hardest thing because at when i first did the joke um, it started like the laugh I got was not a laugh I wanted. And I, it's hard to describe, but I got a certain laugh that I'm like, oh, I don't like why people are laughing at this. Joke. Oh, can and you, I, I can you explain more about that? That's interesting. Um, so, uh, 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 w the first, and this, you're like, they're laughing because they're racist. <laughs> yeah, he, essentially the, and, and you're like, well, how did you know? It's like, you can, I can't tell you how I know. I, I just knew. Cause the first line I, I wrote for the Bud Light joke, um, and this is not the line that made the special, was uh, I think uh, having a trans person as a spokesman for Bud Light actually makes a perfect amount of sense. It's perfect because Bud Light, they tell you it's beer, we have to pretend it's beer, but we all know it's not beer. <laughs> and that was the first line. That's a good and line. See, thank you. And your see your laugh right now. I uh, it was fine. It was good. And I and I and I and I know who you are as a person. So it was good. But like I said that, and the laugh I got was more, yeah. And I'm like, okay, whoa, whoa, calm down, calm, <laughs> calm down. I don't, mm, I don't, I'm not sure if I like this. So switched it up and just tooling with that bit because I try to make all my stuff kind of apolitical to where you don't know. Like, I don't want you to walk out of my show going, oh, Brad, he's definitely conservative or what a, what, what, what a liberal like Brad Williams is. I don't want you to think any of that. I, I just want you to walk out and go, I laughed. I had a good time. So finding that line where I was no, I was not one side and I was not the other. That was that was the most difficult part of of, of just that joke. Mm. And I finally got it right. And I I if if you watch the special uh, Starfish on Veeps, that is the joke I am most proud of. Is it the most funny? I have no idea. Is it the most personal? Absolutely not. It's not about me at all. 
but it's the joke that I work the hardest on and I feel really really nailed it what's your process for building like a new special uh so i have sort of a i i heard bill burr say this one time on a podcast and i was like holy shit that's what i do so uh i like it i i like that it's kind of what he does and, and what i do um once the new special is done i start off in the first jokes I tell on stage after that because you have to replace everything is is the hackiest <laughs> dumbest like it's just stuff I'm not really proud of but it, it's getting laughs and it's out there and then that is my base and then once I do that then I start slowly taking it apart and taking out the hackiness and writing new stuff so there will be there there will be a a fine 40 minutes, 45 minutes, but then I start really tinkering with it. And then that gets up to an hour and that's, and I start replacing the hacky shit and I start getting good stuff that I really like in there. And, uh, so yeah, there, there, there's like a baseline that I'm not very proud of. And then I just build on top of it. And based on, you know, what's ever happening in the news, what's happening in my life, what's happening with my family. And, uh, right now the hour I got post the special starfish, um, I, I, it's fun. It's a fun hour. Good. I like it. I, I, it, it's, so I, the last thing I want is to go on stage and like say a bunch of jokes where I'm just on stage going, this is crap. Like, why are you people even liking this? Yeah. Like it, yeah. It's, but the, but this one is, this one is really fun. I'm excited to see it. The, the, I'm at the hacky level. Um, <laughs> but that, that's the thing. Everyone starts off that well, way. Well, and I have Everyone to build from off. scratch. Like, it's like yeah. most comedians. You can't tell the same jokes that you were telling, you know, five, six years ago when you were single and doing all that. Like, it, it's not, it, it, you're a you're a different person, person completely. now. And you don't have those things. Like, when I listen back to my, God, uh, I would, this was crazy. I was in. Uh, uh, I was in a car, the club had sent a car to take me to the airport, whatever. And the guy had on serious comedy radio and I thought, cool, I'll, I'll hear some friends, hear some bits on the way to the airport. And one of my bits came on and it was from my first album. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> just, just like, oh my God, I, it, it was not, I did not like it. I'm not that in it's because I'm not that yeah. guy anymore. At the time, it worked. Yeah. I was I was in my early 20s, early to mid-20s. That's what my mind was yeah. like at that time. That's what I was talking about. That's what I thought was important. And then now I'm in a different place. So if people say, like, you've changed since your first album, I'd be like, thank Christ. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I was recently going through my whole fet, like playboy archives which have been memory hold but i still have them all screenshot and i was yeah. reading some of the older ones be and i was like oh my god thank <laughs> god this shit was memory old i can't believe i yeah. i was so open about this did i think i would never have a child like it was just like <laughs> what what was i thinking putting this out there but i that's just where i was and that was my life. Man. And I don't think I thought I was going to have a child at 42. And yeah, you just well done, by the thank way. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, def no, that but I think that's, this is why I've really bucked against this. And I, uh, this phrase like makes me cringe, but the, uh, this like, whole cancel culture idea, it does not, yeah. the, uh, the reason it makes me so mad as an artist is it allows no no one to evolve it just allows yeah. for no personal evolution no changing of the mind no you have to come out as a fully formed adult with all your thoughts that by the way whoever these people are that are getting mad at the jokes whether they're in the past or the present whatever it's an issue that they probably didn't care about six years ago right that, that they would have laughed at those jokes, but now they've just become aware of it. And now they feel like everyone has to catch up and automatically be on that yeah. level. And yeah, it, it is kind of 
frustrating that people would expect you to just be a fully formed person with perfect ideas. It's like, no, we have to evolve. We have to grow up. We have to change. And, uh, and one thing that I, uh, I, I was listening to a, a podcast and um, Anthony Jeselnik was on. I love him. And he was talking about it. And he was talking about cancel culture in general. And he said he doesn't think that cancel culture is – really out there it's just that now you can't you have to have a you have to have an opinion you have to have a perspective uh he quoted um uh why am i blanking on him uh he quoted andy warhol who said art is getting away with it and what that means is yeah the art is you say the thing about the topic that is controversial whatever but if it's good and if you're coming from a a good place that's when you get away with it yeah it it it, it 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 it's when the art isn't coming from a good place it's like you can't say what you want anymore it's like you can yeah yeah it's just it's it, if, if, if you're hate if you're a hateful piece of shit yeah some people aren't gonna like it. it it but you know but it but if you're creative and you talk about whatever topic you want to talk about but in a very creative way then you can make it work and also i i think we've all seen that i don't think cancel culture there's definitely people get angry about it, but I mean, if Bill Cosby went on tour tomorrow, he would sell out. <laughs> so yeah, I don't. I, yes I, no. I don't know if we're getting canceled. I like, mean, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know that guys like Anthony Jeselnik have interviewed enough people who aren't huge to know to be like I heard him talk about that and I agree there's there if you have an audience and you're big enough and you have enough escape velocity it won't matter um there's a, some people are too big to fail uh who might even deserve to be quote unquote canceled like Bill Cosby as you mentioned but I've had yes. people on this <laughs> podcast who have legitimately been canceled like musicians who really? thought that they could be crazy and uh -huh. went to the Trump rally and didn't even go to the, uh -huh. and it was falsely reported that they were at the like Capitol, even though they weren't, they were just at the rat and their career was destroyed. And these people are, they're still like it. These are the hardest interviews I've done on my podcast really? because these people are shell shocked. They don't know what happened. Like this guy was like, I thought like, I thought music was where you could be crazy, but he's been blacklisted from, he tried to like get on it blacklisted from everywhere, blacklisted from clubs. And this guy was like an indie darling. And mm. it's so yes and no. I've had enough well, that, people on this podcast whose lives have been laid waste. Uh, yeah. You know, well, for sure. reasons that I would say are ideological that are bullshit, especially in the arts. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and, and for that, I, I'm not one to say like, like, like if I'm, if, if you prove me wrong or, or have examples, I'm fine going, huh, well, look at that. Yeah. That's fine. And by the way, that's how it should yeah. be. Yeah. Hey, look what just happened. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, but, I think but, it's and, like, and, there are some instances where it's overinflated and people are like, I've been canceled. And it's definitely something you can use to like kick that can and be like, please sign up for this and sign. And I try very hard because yes. I rage against victimhood culture. And I've had a lot of weird things happen over the years, but I just try not to use it. But I see how people use it to like fundraise and build up their profile and build up. But then there's there are these instances of it where I've talked to people and um, those those interviews are the ones that keep me up at night. Like they're the most haunting interviews I've done. They stick so, with me. So for you, it, is it like, yeah, if you're kid rock yeah you can say you're fucking rich whatever. and you can you have an audience you already have an audience they're gonna follow you you're fine but it, if, if but you're saying sometimes when when you're on the come up and you haven't built that audience yet that's gonna stick with you or you haven't established or or you have an audience that is liberal no um <laughs> no it's like <laughs> He was <laughs> not liberal, but he was an independent. Like, I think if you have a certain kind of audience, it's more susceptible to like that kind of contagious group think that makes you a wrong person that makes yeah. you bad or wrong for wrong think or whatever. Then, y yes, you risk losing 
your audience if you've cultivated yourself in kind of like the indie echo park world you know you're uh, and suddenly you there's a there's a slate article about you being at the capitol riot or whatever you even if it's not true good luck trying to the lie travels around the world faster than the truth gets out of bed or whatever yeah once that once that happens that's it, it it's so sad when that happens where it's just like well that's just the truth and that's just what everyone knows even though it's not how even though it's not how it went down yeah so yeah so i've seen i've seen it from like all perspectives i think and it's usually and then the other stories that I've heard a lot of just in my inbox are the you know, I call them kind of micro cancellations. And it's usually like intrapersonal intra family, in, interfamily stuff over politics, which I hate hearing and over, you know, writing parents or not letting people see their grandkids or just things like cutting siblings out because of of that or some the one I always think of is this woman who like stepped over some line in her like mommy group and got totally piled on and kind of isolated when she was postpartum. So there's like, I think about those little ones that because they're not famous and they're not, they don't get a, they don't get a yeah, hearing. No, right, right. It, it's just the, the group and your social group right. that you thought that you were part of. It, and yeah, that's, that kind of stuff bums me out because I've got friends that I would say are on both sides and uh, 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 extremes of both. And I don't know, uh, they're nice to me. <laughs> like it, it's so but that's because like, you're a dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they think about Yeah, they 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 think that's what they'll do with like, that's how they go to heaven it, 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 is they just you're say, good yes, luck. but you thought of you. You use the wrong pronoun. Yes, but dwarf friend. Yes, look at this. I can't yes, say shit about friend. your liberal friends are like, well, I can't make fun of him because he's a dwarf, even if he does say yeah. something that he's not using his pronouns, but he's a dwarf. <laughs> he's a dwarf. And then, uh, yeah. And, then, and, and your conservative yeah. friends are like, one of us, one of yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, yeah, the conservative friends are like, well, straight white male, close enough. <laughs> We're good. He's almost we there. Got it. Yeah, he's almost there. We'll let him in. It's fine. He could be in Game <laughs> of Thrones. He's with us. Yeah, I, I, I love, I love the. Uh, I don't even want to call it a pivot that you made, but the, when, when you started doing the whole without a party. Oh, politically homeless. Um, People yeah, think this is some it. shtick. I'm like, I, this is not some act. It would be, you know how fucking oh. rich I would be if I went like full Candace Owens and was just like, I'm MAGA yeah. now. I'd yeah. be fucking yeah. sitting by Lake Travis right now. <laughs> I would be loaded. <laughs> it, it, there was so much money in those hills that I easily could have not turned yeah. down. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and now I'm and still poor. <laughs> and and th and that cost you. But what, like, it, it, it's okay. I just love the term. I just love the term because whenever people say like, "Well, Brad, you know, where where are you?" I always say, "Well, uh, when I'm in when I'm in Hollywood, California, I I am a right wing nut job, and then I hop on a plane and I land in Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm a left wing, you know, psychopath." So it's like that's that's sort that's sort of where we are. Where it's like, no, you I'm not that side. You should be though, and I'm not that comedian side. Comedians <laughs> should be the like they should be Rorschach tests for your own beliefs. Yeah. We are the black blobs that people get to project <laughs> their shit on. We don't. Yes. We're. It's like that famous quote that I live by, which is um about trickster. Trickster makes this world. Hold on. It's basically like trickster is at one time creator and destroyer. He who dupes others, but who also dupes himself. He possesses no morals, but through his actions or lack thereof, all morals come to be like that. This is we are tricksters. We're supposed to play with the lines and play with find those yeah. people. People are, you know, I don't put comedians on a pedestal and think that we're like some, you know, I think there's this like not, weird tendency. Yeah, like I'm like, we're all kind of pieces like of shit. Yeah. Like you said, e egotistical 
um, yeah. assholes. But I do think the service that we provide is that we get to allow people some relief and escape and say things people think and want to say. I mean, even those like weird intrusive thoughts that you get, you know, I was yes, like ev- you think you're alone in those and you're not. It's just all we no, are doing it, is it, letting people know you're not alone. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's not even about like right wing, left wing or anything like that. Like, Hey, I've got some jokes about Pornhub that I know some people will be like, Oh yes, I can't bring this up at work. But, but yes, that. <laughs> yeah, I just think that that's good. It's good if people are like, and I remember I had like a, I think this is what kind of inspired me to get back on stage. I had like a rock bottom moment and it was being asked to be in a movie, but it was a conservative movie. And I love these people, they're friends of mine. It it was just mm-hmm. more the way the film ended that it became like, I was like, you're just doing the same thing that you accuse the left wing of doing, which is like trying to shoehorn some ideology. Just fucking make a funny movie. Can we stop trying to preach? And yes. so I yes. was like, uh, thank you for the thank you, but no thank you. But I was like, I need to get back on stage. <laughs> like, we need to talk about this. And yes, and 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 I'm so glad you brought that up because like there's, you know, there's the whole like uh, go woke, go broke yeah. kind of thing. And like – and some people, when uh, the Captain Marvel movie bombs, they're like, oh, it's oh, it's because it's three women in the lead that that's why nobody watched the film. And it's like, no, we'll watch stuff. It just has to be good. Yeah. Like, it, it, like yeah. if it's good, we'll watch it. The first Wonder Woman was fucking great. It was great. great. The, new, the new Spider-Man, where Spider-Man's black, have you watched it? Fucking yeah. great, okay? It, it's great. We don't look at it like, oh, it's only good because it checks these boxes or it's bad because it checks this, the, these boxes. No, just make it good or we'll watch it. We'll follow yep. it. It's fine. Yep. Like, and I feel the same way about comedy. It's like, it's not, uh, they, they hate me because I'm too right wing. It's like, nah, you're just not funny. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, like, in- it's like, Oh, they, they hate me because I'm too left. It's like, no, you're just, you're, you're, it's not. Good. Yeah. It's not. It's good. an it's easy, people. it's an easy excuse to suck. You know, (laughs) it's like it's an easy way to be like I always joke. I've been making this joke online about how I'm like, it's not the algorithms. I just suck because I'm like, it's the (laughs) algorithms. They're blocking me. I'm being shadow banned. Like, no, you're just not funny or something's not resonating or you're annoying. I know I I can be annoying. I was watching my content like Uh, It's weird because I've been packaging it differently, which is like in these reels, which I haven't really been doing because I've always treated Dumpster Mm. Fire like a show. But then I'm like, oh, this is not on HBO. This is on YouTube. And I should be packaging it. Try messing with the packaging. And then I watch it and I'm like, God, I would I would probably hate myself. (laughs) (laughs) Like I can see why people would hate me and be annoyed. You know, I I get it. I get it. It's so it's so weird you say that because like yeah sometimes I'll tweet something and I'll just be like oh well, that it didn't go anywhere it didn't get the response I wanted I'll be like I thought that was a good joke but it, it, yeah I might be getting shadow banned or whatever it's the new algorithms and then I'll tweet something else and it blows up and I'm just like nope just me just me sucking just that just that's that that's the audience telling you that's when you go on stage and the audience doesn't laugh and you're like yeah it just wasn't a good joke. That's fine. I'll I'll figure out the I'll figure out a new job. Yeah, that's it, I it, think it, that's it, what I've loved good. more than anything getting being back is like the the process is yeah. so interactive and because I've been given this like my friend Ariel um Isaac Norman, she's a comedian here. She's hilarious. She does this show, The Gay Enough Show, which is mostly gays, but somewhat not. But the audience is pretty liberal and often gay. And it's good because, and like last night, it was like 30 people and not, I was the only person in that room with a child. And I got on stage and I was like, oh, this makes sense why you guys are all here in this torrential rain. Cause I was driving here. Like, am I going to leave my child motherless for fucking 15 minutes in like a shitty yeah. club? Just to do this <laughs> yeah, just set. To do like, this that's, set. Why. that's why mommy was out in this horrible weather driving. Right. 
Yeah. I'm like, oh, tell, you guys tell, have tell, nothing to tell, live tell for. Tell me again. Tell me again what uh, what mommy was like. <laughs> why she die? Well, she had a niche, and she had a new joke. She just had to get out there, so she went out in a rainstorm. She knew it was dangerous, but she didn't care. She knew that those gays would give her an honest response, and that's why she did it. She went to make 30 gays laugh and 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 not feed it's so them. good That's for me though happened. no i mean it, it was <laughs> i was like am i self it's, i thought about turning around like five times i was like i should not be driving in this weather this is dangerous and then i was like i must keep going that that is a thought i have so many yeah. times when i'm when i'm on stage i'm i'll, I'll be in like oh, okay so here's an example uh, uh last week i was in fresno california now is Fresno one of the big <laughs> hubs of comedy? No, it's not typically a city where a lot of people go. But uh, I went. I did a show. We sold out the theater. It was great. It was wonderful. I'm glad I did it. But there was a part of me that was like, really? I'm not hanging with my daughter right now because I'm in Fresno? <laughs> like, that's like, that's okay. It, it, like, right now, if, if she's like, where's daddy? Then mom has to say, Fresno. That that that's where that's where daddy is. Probably. At least but, you're selling out of theater. Mommy's going to a mommy's going to a tiny club with 30 people. <laughs> At least you're like yeah. somewhat have an excuse. Oh no, oh no. I definitely cried in a pile of money that night. Uh, 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 and that helped. You know, that that definitely when you're wiping away your tears with just all the all the copious amounts of money uh then yes that's good yeah but uh yeah there 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 are definitely those parts where you wonder like am i am, am i selfish am i yes bad for doing no. this but then you know you think about but no this is that this is the job yeah this is the job this is what the job yeah. is so yeah it's what it it's what we have to do <laughs> yeah what was your what was your favorite part of your new special oh favorite um uh so this so this so so this is something that um is like you can't tell watching this but like or, or you could tell I'll I'll explain. My fa my favorite part about the about the new special and if you watch it uh on Veeps called Starfish. I know I've plugged it a few times. I'm going to do it probably two more times. Uh uh but the fact that I didn't tell the audience that we were making a special. Oh, I okay. I didn't tell them. They, they, it wasn't come out, see live tape. So they weren't of, like, <laughs> yeah, I didn't. So I didn't. So, but the then, fake like, chuckles. Yes. So, and the audience response, you'll see. I mean, obviously they figured it out when they got there and there was a fucking camera jib, but like, but like that's not why they were there. They weren't there because it was going to be recorded. But they 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 got in the room because they were my fans and they wanted to see a Brad Williams show. And then the response that they were giving me was just so like, okay, this this is cool. So the fact that we advertised the show and got the audience in that way, the fact they were just authentic comedy fans. They they weren't people that were like, let's go sit in the audience of a live sitcom taping. Um, uh, uh, which I've done, which is, uh, horrible. Uh, but yeah, so they were, they were the, they were the, they were authentic comedy fans. And the fact that they gave me that response, which if you watch it, you'll see it. Um, that's it. Like, that's my favorite part. Uh, doing the material that I had done, you know, a thousand times le leading up to the special was great to finally get that over with. Mm -hmm. But the fact that, uh, oh, and here's another thing. This was the first time I was able to do two shows. Oh, cool. Every other show, like for the one that you saw in Glendale at the Alex Theater, I we had one shot. Wow. One. And it was just like, okay, because I didn't, I wasn't selling that many tickets. Yeah. We sold, we sold enough to sell out the theater once. I couldn't do it twice. Yeah. So we had, we had, we had one shot. And if you remember, I don't know if you remember this, but during that special, I even had a moment where I completely forgot what I was saying. And I stopped and I paused and I was like, hold on, forgot the joke, I'll get it. And then as I'm doing that, the only thing I could think in my head was, oh my God, my mom's in the audience right now and she's probably worried out of her mind. Like, oh no, he forgot a joke. So I started talking to her from the stage like, don't worry mom, I'm fine. 
I'm okay. I got a joke. It, it'll it'll come back. And then it clicked back. I was like, okay, cool. Now let's yeah. go. And then in, 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 in the edit, it just looked seamless. Yeah. But the fact that I, I had a chance to do it twice, um, the first crowd was great. So I'm like, cool, we got it. Second one, let's have fun. And it's always the let's have fun crowd where you're like, oh, now we went to another level. Yeah. And that and, and that and that's what happened. So if you watch the special Starfish on Veebs, told you I'd plug it again. Uh, that would be the majority of the show that you're watching is the second show. That's amazing. <laughs> What's your? It's a fun, fun. Yeah, process. I I someday hope to be doing that. Maybe maybe <laughs> when I'm like 55. <laughs> uh, hey man. Uh, it, it gets said all the time. Ro uh, Rodney Dangerfield really didn't break as a stand-up comedian until he was like 59 years old. So yeah, there's this new yeah. woman too who's around, and she's just kind of broke through. And I'm blanking on her name right now, but um, she's older and just like has been kind of. It's yeah, life happens, you know. Stand up life, is a grind. Life happens. Yeah, and and uh, the thing is, is that you started a little later and then you took a break, but if you could build it up, what a great accomplishment that that will be. And all while you're still being successful in other realms. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, it's so you're fun. You're killing it. No, I mean, I feel, I feel very just overall grateful about life. But there was something that like internally that I didn't realize in my soul that <laughs> was freed up the minute I got back on stage. Like it feels, you know, I feel like I'm going into the new year a little bit lighter. Oh, I love here. And that. I'm so glad that I'm having my first podcast back talking to one of my favorite comedians and just general humans. And I'm and we have to keep a better touch. Um, yeah, no, no kidding. I know. We, I know uh, uh, when you either when you moved or I don't know when it happened. But yeah, we, we kind of fell out, but not in a bad way. Just like yeah, no people, life. They start. You got married. Lives. I got married. Married. Like yeah. yeah. Kids. Kids. The whole the, the whole the whole thing. Right. But now we're but now we're going through this next stage of life, kind of at the same time together. So it's a lot of fun. So absolutely. Yeah. So what's your biggest defect of character? Oh, my last two question. questions. Always the same. What a question. Um, biggest defect of character. Uh, 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 well, I, I, I would say because I'm a stand up comedian, um, that probably means I'm, that probably means I'm a little bit narcissistic. The fan, the, the, the fact that I go on stage and in front of hundreds, sometimes thousands of strangers, and I just expect everyone to be quiet and let me talk. Uh, that's probably a little narcissistic. So I'd say that, um, but if my past relationships and uh, certain conversations I've had with my wife are any indication, it's that I never know when to not say the joke. <laughs> I, always, I always say the joke, always, in, in like the most serious conversations. And sometimes, man, that joke can hit and levity and great. Sometimes, wrong time for a Too joke, soon. wrong time. Yeah, wrong time, and it, it it yeah. So I so I would say a uh, a uh, dusting of narcissism, and uh, don't know uh, don't know when the joke uh, should not be said. What is your biggest asset? My ass. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very large. Dwarves. It's a curved spine. It pops out. It's a badunk a dunk. Anyway, um, biggest asset. Uh, uh, I actually just watched um, the new Chappelle special. And oh yeah, I watched line that. In there that I really liked, where he said, uh, 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 "People say, oh, you have a fun job," and he goes, "No, I don't have a fun job. I'm a fun person." I loved that line. And yeah, where I'm like, ah, yes, because I think if you stuck me at a factory at an assembly line. I'd still be a fun guy in the break room, like I'd be a a, a fun dude, and and we, uh, after work I would still be fun. So it's like, I I I think the biggest asset is that I'm fun. If if you're around and uh, you're around me and 
you're a friend, you're you're gonna have a good time. You're you're gonna have fun no matter what the situation. And this is also going back to the first question, like what's what's the thing that you know? Uh, what's your flaw? Is that sometimes I'm fun in times when we I shouldn't be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I sh sometimes I should be serious and I go for fun. So yeah. uh, that is an asset and that is also a detriment. So yes, I would say yeah, just I'm fun. I think having a daughter when she's going through her like sensitive teenage time will probably cure you of some of that knowing when to joke and when not to. <laughs> That's gonna be that's gonna be a time. That, yeah, that, that's gonna be a time. But she's gonna have to she's gonna have to realize. And I'm gonna I'm we're both gonna have to make compromises. I'm definitely gonna have to not make jokes as much as I want to, and she's gonna have to realize that this is just what dad Daddy. does. Yeah, is is, is 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 I make jokes. Uh, so kids uh, are the best. Yeah, that'll be a part of it. Everyone yeah, needs great. to have I, kids. <laughs> <laughs> if not, it it. it it, it, at least be a very involved uncle or aunt. Yes. Like just in, just involved. Like you know, like I'm not saying 24 seven. Just yeah, just, you can just be, borrow be them. There. Um, the yeah, just the perspective that kids that kids will give you in terms of making you realizing what's important, what's not important. Now I I don't care about other stuff. I care about my kid. I care about making sure that she's good. That's that's. That's what I'm going at. So it's funny too how much be... more I care about the future. <laughs> like right? before I had a kid, I was like, I don't give a fuck. You guys are all on your own. And now I'm like, oh shit. I've got to care about what we leave uh, behind. Ah, uh, now now I gotta get it now I gotta get an electric car. <laughs> no private jets for this girl. No, that's why you're turning it down. Right. For the environment. <laughs> Good job. Draw that line. Yes, I'm doing it for you, child. Um, this has been so fun. I'm so glad we got to ca catch up. I'm so excited for everyone to go watch your special on. You can plug it for the for time. V E E P S. It's called Starfish. Enjoy it. Thank you. And yes, it, it was definitely fun to catch up. Always fun to talk to you. And uh, yeah, let's talk more. We don't even need microphones. We don't. Nope. Need to, we have to, phones. To, just yeah, we have phones. We. We can do that. Where can we all find? Where can we find you um, on social media? Uh, on Instagram at Brad Williams Comic, on Twitter uh, at Funny Brad, and uh, all my tour dates are on uh, BradWilliamsComedy.com. So just go there. I got over seventy dates already posted in uh, in uh, twenty twenty four. Go there, find find a show that's near you, and. Uh, get a ticket and have a fun time at, at the theater. Not to say that you're shadow banned, but I don't ever see your tweets. All right, let's figure that shit out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Well, you're, you're in Austin. Go talk to Elon. Okay. <laughs> Daddy Elon. Tell, tell, Elon maybe, hates me because I, I made him my nemesis as a joke four years ago on Dumpster Fire, and then he fucking bought Twitter. I'm like, oh. Uh, maybe it's because we keep calling it Twitter and not X. <laughs> so find me on X at Funny Brad and lift the shadow band. <laughs> All right. You're the best. I wish you much success, young Lucky. Like and both of us now that we had our lucky podcast. Yep, done and done. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank always, you for coming. Always great seeing you. You too. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Pluto TV is TV the way it should be, free, with over three hundred channels, thousands of movies and TV shows, costing zeros of dollars. So if you want to watch shows like Ghost, The Walking Dead, CSI, Star Trek, or The Price Is Right, well, The Price Is Right, it's free. Hit movies like Braveheart, Sonic the Hedgehog, Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, or Mean Girls won't cost you a thing because everything is free. All you have to do is download the app, which, by the way, is also free. Pluto TV. Stream now. Pay never. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. How you doing? Good. This is a virtual check-in from my apartment. Feeling more settled? Yeah, my couch is on its way. It should arrive in like two weeks. Nice. Where's it coming <laughs> yeah. from? 
California. Oh. <laughs> Same California. Thing. Same thing. Yeah, I'm just still still getting settled. Still a lot to do, but Yeah. Do you like your you know, neighbors and your Yeah. Neighborhood. It's, it's a good little area. I like it. There's a lot going on. Good. Still kind of trying to meet my neighbors. Maybe you know you should organize a meet and greet for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that doesn't sound awkward at all. They have uh they have little like kind of community events like they're doing something for St. Patrick's Day next week. Fun. Yeah, but I don't know if I'll be in town or not for that. It's on Thursday, so I guess we'll see. Uh, when's St. Patty's Day? Next week? Uh, it's Sunday the 19th. Oh, holy shit. I'm definitely going to do my Irish Catholic stuff when I perform in Dallas. Oh, yeah, you should. I mean, I have oh, no, to. It's, it's Sunday the 17th, I think. But it's Hang that on. weekend because I'm performing yeah. on the 15th. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just talk about being Irish Catholic. Right. I'll be like, oh, my God, it is my people's holiday. They're all rolling over in their grave. My I'm grandfather. Spitting in the face of my ancestors. I will be spitting in the face of my ancestors this weekend by maintaining my sobriety. It's <laughs> 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 exactly how I'm going to open. Yep. Oh, all I want to do is comedy. All I want to do is comedy. You had a really good set last night. It was a fun it was, crowd. It was great. It was good. You had some new material. Yeah, I'm learning what works with the libs. Yeah. It's good to know. You I got, got some clap. I got you got some clapter. <laughs> I was like, I am never telling these jokes again. <laughs> The only ever time I've received anything close to, like applause breaks are one thing, and I used to get those a lot for the waitressing stuff where I was just uh -huh. calling out all the dipshits I would wait on in L.A. Uh -huh. um, I don't think it's quite the same as Clapter. Last night was, I, that might have been the first time I ever got Clapter in my that life. That was like aggressive <laughs> Clapter, too. That was like, like, please yeah. stop. And it kept happening. I know. It was really funny. It was like once I told them to stop doing it, they wanted to do it more. Yeah. And of course, there's always like one hippie who's had a home birth in the audience. So yeah, I'm, I'm starting like that. That's the fun, the best part about comedy. And the thing that I'm really starting to enjoy is that I have no fear of the audience anymore. And uh -huh. so I feel like I can really just get up and connect with them. And really, uh -huh. like every every single set is an opportunity co to connect with multiple people in one way or another. Um, and I just have to remind myself, like they all deserve my best. You know, I always am just like, whatever I do, I'm just gonna get up there and try and connect to somebody. Yeah, and it's fun. It's just so fun. So it, I, I'm having more fun than I ever had doing comedy before. And I had a, a shitload of fun doing comedy before, but I think because I'm so much more confident. I mean, last night, some of the jokes that did the best were literally things I was thinking about five minutes before I went on stage because sometimes comedians who go up before me will trigger memories or stories. And I've been listening to my old Rogan episodes because none of them, one of them is transcribed miraculously. Uh. But like you would think every freaking Rogan episode ever recorded would be transcribed somewhere. And it's not, you can't, uh -huh. it's impossible to find actually. So, and I know that I've mentioned a lot of stand up stuff that I wanted to work on on his podcast and in ways that were funny that made even him laugh. So I've been listening to them again. And that's a trip, let me tell you. Yeah. Did you start with the oldest one? Yeah. Uh -huh. I haven't even gotten through the oldest one. And I, and I started it like two weeks ago. I'm like, <laughs> my God, how, does pe how do people listen to these every day? Yeah, so some of it was stuff that was like my memory was jogged because I'll listen to it on the way in to do comedy. And then I'll be like, oh, I'll try that tonight, which is what's so great about that that show. 
Right. Is that I feel the stakes are so low. I feel like I can really just do what I like. She wants us to do all new stuff. So, um, um yeah, it's well, fun. How have your nerves been? Have your nerves been getting better? Yeah, a lot better. I just get excited. Like now I just want to get, you know, I get nerves. I feel like my heart racing and a little that adrenaline, but it's more like, yeah, let me up there. Not so Not much like deathly fear. Crippling stage fright. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's changing a lot of just, I think the more, my mantra is really like, I belong here. And I think the more I really believe, I do believe 90% of comedy is just getting on stage and and conveying that you belong there. Absolutely. And it's it was interesting, you know, last night and then there you did a, a, set, a show a couple weeks ago too where I was like, there were, like last night there was a brand new comic on stage. Yeah. And, and we were told she was a co- brand new comic, which is always good because you want to be a little nice to them as the audience. But you can just tell like she it was just like she's just running through her like memorized set up joke, set up joke, set mm-hmm. up joke. like it, it just kind of, you know, very obviously you can tell the people who are been on stage and are comfortable and have been doing it a while. And you are one of those people. It's not you're not a newbie. No, no, I could get up there and riff. You could. Yeah. I mean, I actually think I'd be really good at the bottom of the barrel show that they do at Mothership, where you just pick out topics and riff right. on them. Right. Um. I really want to do that show. I think it would be. I love that stuff. Like, give that's. It's such a good skill. You can come up with really good routines. It's almost like Write Club, where I love the writing, which I need to do. If you are in our right club, I apologize. I I I overestimate the um I underestimate how much cuz whenever I go out people are like, "How do you do all the things that you're doing? How are you do, how is this output even possible?" And um yeah. Because it is like yesterday I woke up at 6 in the morning, finished my P, and it's all creative output where it's like performing, interviewing, reading, taking information in and writing and all this stuff. And sometimes I'm just fried. Like, I, I think I really just um, underestimate how much, how, how much, much I'm, I'm you're trying doing to and do. How much and, ha- and I have yeah. a toddler. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not great about that. And I just need to do one writing prompt and keep the, those stakes very low. But that's what that feels like, too, where it's just like, uh, all right, well, I don't really know what's going to come out from here, but we'll see. And you're trying to get your book proposal finished, too. Like that's, that's been, been the priority. Focus. I'm so close, too. I'm so close to like having something I can actually turn in. Because now I'm just to the point where I'm writing the book. Right. It's like 5,000 words. A book proposal should not be 5,000 words. That's like a fucking chapter in a book. So I've got to dial it back because I do. I want to tell that there's so much stuff that I want to dig into. Even when I've been writing my columns lately that have been so fun for me, um, there's just so much stuff I want to dig into and the culture that I've gone through that. I could sink. I can see how I could really sink my teeth into each chapter of this book now. And and you know, sometimes you're like, "How am I gonna turn this into a book, an idea?" Right. Because you have to. But now it's like, as I write this proposal, I'm like, "Oh no, there's so much stuff that I want to explore." And some of it might be research, and some of it might be interviews, and some of it might just be stories. And I'll just, I just have to write it. I just have to sell it and write it. Right. But it's, yeah, it's cool. I've been like digging Austin more and more. And the more people I meet, the more I love it. And I really try to put myself out, just getting out into Austin, going to different places. I met an amazing woman who's coming on the podcast yesterday. There's being here with South by Southwest. Tons of my friends are in town. It is it is like the kind of new cultural hub that everybody comes through constantly now. Yep. And it's like, it's awesome. I just, I, I see that only accelerating in the next decade. People are moving here just for comedy. It's just like a cool time. It feels a lot like when I moved to LA and it was really kind of booming and 
and like the the rise of the influencer was just starting to occur. So there was all of this fun, creative, like the YouTubers were just blowing up. It was 2007. Yeah. So it was like, there was so much of that cool new energy there. And I think that that's something that I love. And I love being so close to Dallas and there's so much to explore. It's taken me, it, it definitely was like an adjustment. And then we went into the, I don't know, I was talking to the woman yesterday and she was saying, just get out for the summer. She's like, you should just go back east for the whole summer. And I was like, once my once the dog goes, I might actually consider that. <laughs> yeah. All you right. Just set well, up speaking, dumpster speaking fire of- in your basement. <laughs> yeah, we could. It would be We'd amazing. Absolutely could. Yeah, it wouldn't be hard. Uh-uh. Just I bring the, the blanket and the flag with us. It's dumpster fire. <laughs> it can be whatever. Um, it can be like Alex Jones in the basement. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-Ins Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)